Welcome to our UCLA Extension Department of Business, Management, and Legal Programs video lecture series on entrepreneurship, new venture formation, and strategic business plan development. The video that you are about to watch is an introduction to business funding. I'm Harry Redinger, your instructor. There are over 40 videos in our video lecture series that are that integrate with our UCLA Extension online course management program Canvas. There, uh, the videos strive to be brief, but they do overlap each other to tie our curriculum together. Okay, let's get started. Okay, well, first and foremost. Um, there are only three ways to acquire business funding. First is debt funding. It's where we borrow money. It's like a credit card. We go to the bank and we borrow it. We pay interest and we've got to pay it back. Uh, the next is equity funding, where we uh, sell interest in our organization, where we to form a corporation, uh, we have to separate the business from ourselves. In order to do that, there has to be a, a separate legal entity set up that we can sell equity interest in. We're going to go over how to do that. <clears throat> and then the third, and I've, I've changed the, <clears throat> the color of this, uh, is ingenuity. And I'm a real fan of using ingenuity to fund your business. Uh, and we'll talk about that too. Uh, so how can we create a business that can fund your business? And, and there's, an, uh, there's, there's kind of a fun, funny saying out there, um, killing two birds with one stone. So we're going to uh, talk about how to use um, entrepreneurial ingenuity to fund our business. Um, <clears throat> Business business startup funding is very hard to acquire. So if you and if you stop and think about it, um, uh, eighty percent, I believe, eighty ninety percent of businesses fail within the first two and a half years. I mean, the the failure rate of businesses is is, is off the charts. I mean, if 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 a business has if if businesses and and specifically in, in industries like the restaurant industry, construction industry, there's a number of industries that just are prone for really really super high failure rates. Um, and you're a bank, would you loan money to someone who's a startup? For instance, in the like the restaurant industry of all industries, um, uh, that that has no experience, and they want and 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 they want to borrow. Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, or or half a million dollars, when you when there is a failure rate of ninety eighty percent probability that they will fail. I don't think so. So you know, banks aren't in the business of of uh, taking on any risk. Same thing if you were to form an equity and, and, and ask for investors. Again, people are going to take a look at it and go, what's the risk factor of losing all the money I put into it? So that's the first thing you're going to have to deal with is when you approach people for funding uh, and, and they take a look at the, you know, the risk factor associated with loaning money or giving money or investing in you. It sometimes doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So you got to take that into consideration when you're when you go into the marketplace looking for for money. And of course, <clears throat> you know if you have a a, a well written business plan and a strategy, well that makes a big difference too. But um, <clears throat> but I think one of the th one of the strategies we we want to explore in the process of funding once we know what we need to get started is, and I call this uh, MacGyver Ingenuity. There's a, there was a TV series that was developed back in, uh, I think, the 1970s called MacGyver. And there's been a relaunch of this business, of this series uh, today in, um, you know, the 2000, 2017, I think, was is, is when it launched, uh, called MacGyver. And MacGyver is this guy who's a scientist, just very brilliant, and, um, you know, it's a good guy, bad guy, adventure kind of film, and, and uh, 
And MacGyver is somebody who can, you know, with just with 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 scarce resources. Okay, that's a key word. With scarce, limited resources, like rubber bands, paper clips, and um, a book of matches, and a Coke bottle, uh, and some cleaning solution. Next thing you know, things are blowing up, and you know the the, the bad guys are running away, and the good guys are running in, and you know, you know, it's it's, it's one of these kind of adventure, you know, type TV series. But it's just, you know, it's just genius at taking um, just miscellaneous junk type stuff uh, to maneuver out of a, a very complex and threatening situation. Well, it's an entrepreneur that's funding your business and you're really passionate. I mean, this business is your life. It's a, a projection of everything you want to be, but you need this little bit of seed money to kind of get the things from point A to B and, and offer something to the market. You know, how can we do this um, in a way that <clears throat> we're more in control versus selling our soul to a bank or a, vo a vulture capitalist or something of this sort? So, you know, we really sometimes have to twist our brain with much ingenuity. You know, what are the minimum, absolute minimum things that I can do to, to trigger this, the growth of this dream come true business for me? And um, um, so I want, I'm going to click on my, my next video here. Um, this is what, one of many favorite books I have, but it's a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and the author is um, Robert Kiyosaki. And he's got YouTube videos and, and uh, very successful um, in, um, in the development of and, and promotion of his book here, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I think he's developed several other books too, but... But um, the book basically tells the story of him growing up, and his father always invested in cash flow. You know, the, 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 he talks about the d doormat of his house being kind of worn out, and, and his father wouldn't replace it until it was really just dead and gone. So he always made sure money went into, in, into things that <clears throat> created cash flow. His father never spent any money on things that uh, he felt was uh, keeping up with the Joneses, keeping up with the next door neighbor. And in the book, he talks about um, <clears throat> a friend of his whose father is uh, president of the local um, uh, school district. And his, and his friend's father does parties, has this big, huge, palacious house, <clears throat> and uh, spends lots of money on fancy watches and cars, you know, to, to keep up with the image of being president of the, 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 the school district. And as the story unfolds, his friend's, his friend's father dies in, you know, poverty, and Richard Kiyosaki's father is a philanthropist, very successful, multi-million you know, dollar, multi-million dollar uh, 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 investor, uh, very, very successful, um, cash flows for the rest of his life. So, you know, as you go through this startup process, um, I want to encourage you to think about ways of funding the business through your business. Is there a way that you can have an alternative strategy where you develop a side, very small business, or a nonprofit that that you're very passionate about, and the nonprofit um, allows you to meet people who <clears throat> could become on your advisory board, who become um, friends and <clears throat> friends and family investor that do lots of little micro loans that they don't really need back immediately to get you off the ground, and they're on, on board as um, loving, caring uh, advisory board members that believe in what you're, you're trying to do. That's totally different than dealing with a bank or dealing with um, you know, a vulture capitalist investor that wants five times his or her investment back within five years. So, so let's approach the whole mindset of funding your business in kind of a dynamic way uh, that you might there, that that represents synergy, that represents um, uh, ingenuity, um, that uh, blends in well with your phases of competitive development, and it might even be an approach that gives you more experience. It, it might uh, might be an approach that that phase one or two of the launch business allows you to have some 
entrepreneurial value proposition ladder kind of approach where you're not making a lot of money, but you're not spending a lot of money, but you're also meeting a lot of uh, uh, powerful people such as writing a book and selling the book and the book brings income in it doesn't require a lot of overhead and this allows you to start to create the relationships that then in turn give you the clients and when you have a contract to do something big now when you go to the bank this is a form of funding called factoring by the way now the bank's very eager to lend you the money because they see the contract and now they want to help you build the business to, to fulfill the contract. Anyway, <clears throat> um, the primary focus of this talk is going to deal with debt funding and equity funding and so let's get started with a conversation on debt funding. So debt funding first and foremost the most easiest and simplest way to approach is granted you've got good credit is credit cards um, and and credit cards is everyone knows you just whip it out of your wallet and there it is but the catch is credit cards can have an 18 20 percent um, uh, interest rate and <clears throat> so it, so whatever you put on the credit card um, that times 20 percent divide by 12 months that's what you're going to pay every month on that on that money the next is a bank line of credit, which is not that much different than a credit card. It just got better terms, a lower, lower uh, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, interest rates. So, uh, but but bank line of credits is is, a, is another, but they can they can add up on you. And so, but that's another form of funding. The next is friends and family borrowing where um, uh, you're, you, you're loaned money from your parents or your immediate family uh, or an advisory board members. <clears throat> the only caution here is be careful about um, approaching friends and family for money because sometimes you can take a really valuable, uh, loving, caring relationship and when you get money mixed in with it, eh, sometimes things don't work out too well. And you don't want to lose a lifelong friend or, or damage a relationship uh, with a, a loan that uh, you can't afford to pay back uh, and can't afford to pay back within a realistic amount of time and, and then all of a sudden it's just things don't work out right. So be very cautious about um, uh, approaching uh, friends and family for money. Now, if it can be done as a group and a, a as a group as a, of a, of a, 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 a invest of a, an advisory board type approach, <clears throat> where there's a group of people participating in this form of funding, I think that's a little bit of a different story because uh, it, uh, no one feels singled out. The next is uh, our SBA loans, and SBA, SBA is, our go is a government uh, loan. SBA stands for Small Business Administration Loans. So you know how these things worked at, work out. The SBA has relationships with big major banks, and, uh, and the banks agree to loan money to you at a very, very, very low interest rate. And if you default on the loan, the, the government uh, agrees to pay the bank back. So it's actually banks lending the money, not the government. And the government's there if in the event that you default. And if you are uh, negligent uh, with the money you borrow and make no attempt to start a business, that is a criminal effect, uh, offense. And so an SBA loan can actually land you in jail. So bear in mind, if you do pursue an SBA loan and, uh, and you're not competent in, in, in your approach of using money and you don't pay it back, the government will come after you. So just be aware of that. There is a division of the SBA that's got government like the like federal agents that that have badges and guns that'll come after you. I know I, there was a <clears throat> a ten year um, <clears throat> uh, uh, stint phase. 
<coughs> in my life many, many uh, decades ago where I taught all of the uh, 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 business plan development courses for the Greater Los Angeles SBA. And they always invited me to their Christmas party. And I'll never forbid, forget going to uh, an, a, the, an SBA uh, Christmas party and I was sitting next to this gentleman in a polyester suit and I realized that he had a gun on. <laughs> so I don't what are you doing here? <laughs> and that's how, that's how I discovered that there is a, you know, a criminal um, uh, a fraudulent uh, uh, division, fraud, fraud investigation division of the SBA. You know, uh, credit cards. So, um, uh, so we all have them, and uh, and they can get blown out of proportion. And this comes back to Robert Kiyosaki: invest in in, in cash flow, not debt. And so, you got to manage these guys carefully. Next is a bank line of credit. And so they work very much just like a, a credit card. In fact, they often will send you a credit card. You can't tell the difference. Um, but, uh, but basically, uh, in most cases, when you open up, they give you a, a, che a checkbook. And when you write checks, it comes out of that, that line of credit, credit line. Uh, the next are bank loans. Now, the main thing you need to be aware of, of this is, um, you know, banks are not in the business of taking risk. Um, you know, a colleague of mine who's been teaching finance at UCLA Extension for, for years and years and years uh, uh, demonstrates this, that if he put a two by, floor, a two by four on the floor and, um, and he says, uh, um, uh, 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 will you walk across this for um, five dollars? And they get well, sure. He walks across. He walks across. It's on the floor. He walks across the two by four on the floor, and here you get the five dollars. Um, and and then if he held the two by four uh, three feet off the ground, maybe you know some volunteers in the in the class uh, agreed to hold the two by four three three feet off the floor and walk across the two by four. Um, he says, would you walk across it? You know, balance yourself and walk around for five bucks, you might go, wow, okay, um, yeah, okay, um, I'll do it. And someone helps me, walks across, and okay, here's the five bucks. Now if you take that two by four and put it 20 feet in the air and say, well, you walk across the two by four for five, five bucks is what you're going to make on the loan, by the way, okay, so it's a big, and, 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 and the two by four is 20 feet up in the air, are you, are you, will you walk across for, for five bucks? You're asking the banker. The banker's going, no, <laughs> absolutely not. Well, that's the same kind of scenario you have when you, when you go to the bank and you want to borrow uh, an unsecured, an unsecured um, business loan with the bank. Uh, and that's the kind of response. You so banks often want you for major business type loans. They often want you to have three years of experience before they even consider you and, and 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 if you survive three years, you probably are successful enough. You probably don't need the loan. So what's kind of awkward about this is when you leave need the the money the most, no one wants to loan to you from a banker standpoint, other than credit card type, really expensive money, credit card type loans. So kind of keep that in mind because the banks are 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 looking at you, going you know ninety percent of startups are going to fail within the first two and a half years of business pretty risky and if, and if you crash and fail we're, the banks they're lost the money and they and again they take money from people who you know um, invest in the bank for returns on their investment and so banks uh, want to put that money to work and they charge not really big interest rates when when people you know invest and in, deposit money in the banks so they're absolutely not interested in loaning money to a bank or uh, to a business that a, a venture that's that's a startup um, but when banks do lend, and I want to talk just a little bit about how banks evaluate your business if you are going to apply for a bank loan. So the banks use what's called the six C's of credit. And the first is credibility. Do you have a business plan? Are you organized? Are, are you, um, <clears throat> do you, have you done an industry analysis, a market analysis? And they're going to ask, do you have a business plan? No business plan? Nope, not too great on the credibility side. <clears throat> 
character? Um, do you have um, the demeanor, uh, the, the, the elegance? Uh, um, do you have a, a psychological and personality type that, that, just, that, that you would expect to find <coughs> a successful entrepreneur to have in <coughs> whatever industry that you're, you're starting your business in? So, you know, you have to have um, a, some charm and uh, professionalism. And if they don't pick up on that, you probably score pretty low on the character category. Capability. Do you have the knowledge, the experience, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the industry connections, uh, the track record uh, to be capable of, um, <clears throat> you know, starting, starting your business and, 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 and growing the business? Uh, next is uh, capital. Do you, have you made a capital investment? So if we do this loan, or do you have the equipment to, to expand and grow? And so, you know, do you have the, 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 the capital in investments already in place that show that you're competent to take this, this money they're going to loan to you and, and, and build the business with? And then capacity. Um, do you have the, the, the human resources, uh, the inventory, uh, uh, the, is, are you in a position of capacity to capitalize on this loan? If we invest money into you, are you uh, are able to put that money to work and start growing? And then also, um, do you have working capital in place? Uh, or do you manage uh, the money well? Uh, and so banks use a number of, um, of, uh, of, of uh, credit assessment type tools to evaluate your business in terms of financial ratios. So we want to uh, take a quick look, and this gets pretty mathy, and we're just going to do a really, really light overview of some of these uh, ratios on how they'll evaluate your financial statements. And again, this kind of assessment is an assessment that takes place on your business after you've been in business for about three years. So you should have three years of tax returns, financial statements for them to analyze uh, when you go to the bank for a loan. Um, first is the uh, liquidity ratio, and liquidity ratios measures your company's ability to pay debt uh, and debt obligations. And they're very interested in that because if they loan money, how well, what's your capability of paying that money back? Next is asset management ratios, and asset management ratios attempt to measure um, your organization's success in managing its assets uh, uh, to uh, generate sales. The next are debt management ratios, and debt man management ratios attempt to measure the firm's use of financial leverage and ability to avoid financial distress uh, in the long run. Uh, the next uh, set of financial ratios are profitability ratios, and pro pro profitability ratios uh, measure uh, the profitability, which is a way to measure the company's performance. And then market value ratios and this is like the value of the company, market value ratios are used to evaluate the current share price of a publicly held company's stock. Um, and so what banks do is they first look up your SIC code number um, from Standard & Poor's, Dun & Bradstreet, Hoover's, or First Research, and then they take your financial statements and they plug these ratios um, into, uh, uh, they take your financial statements and plug them into these ratios that, um, that apply to your industry and, and then see, do the ratios that your financial ge uh, statements generate, are they in the average zone below or above the national average? And, and if they're all average or above, then, then the lights are green for, for a loan to happen. Banks have to do what's called due diligence. They just can't loan the money. Someone's got to sit there and analyze and say, what's the risk factor associated with doing a loan? And so all banks have their, their um, tolerance. Their, the, they have ways of saying, of determining what's the level of risk they're willing to take. And they might come back and say, well, here's what we're lending money at for businesses, but if the risk is too high, they might say, well, we'll do the, we'll do the deal, but we want a higher interest rate. So uh, based on uh, poor financial ratio information. 
So um, <clears throat> again, uh, uh, liqui uh, there's some more ratios. There's, there's liquidity ratios. There's asset management ratios. There's debt management ratios, profitability ratios, and market value ratios. These next few slides, I don't want to get into the detail because of just you know time management, and we just want to do an overview of these. But these are the actual ratio formulas, and uh, and uh, and so uh, they again. You, you if you uh, once you have a, and if you go back, we had, and watch our video on uh, financial statements. You can kind of see where these numbers come from the the uh, financial statements you generate with Quick and QuickBooks and the the general ledger chart of accounts where you can get you know uh, uh, a statement of your your current assets your total assets your current liabilities and dividing them and working these things out so all these ratios um, <clears throat> Take you know whether you're a little business or a medium or big business. When you uh, a ratio is a ratio, so it's going to be two to one or a certain percent. It's not, so so the banks can can analyze it based on a ratio number, not an actual dollar a volume. It's a, so it's a way of looking at businesses from a performance or having a, a way <clears throat> of looking at uh, businesses uh, with a certain kind of equality. So here's current ratio, debt ratio, um, inventory turnover ratio. Um, uh, the next couple slides uh, uh, are a table then that, that gets all these ratios out and you can stop the video but if you're in the class you're getting PDFs of these and if this is uh, uh, if you feel that this is information you want to learn more about um, you can study it that way um, a little trick that I've I've realized that if you go and buy a, um, a super duper high powered financial calculator, these um, powerful financial calculators uh, often come with um, very large how to use them books. And the manual and these calculators cover all this stuff. If it's a, you know, if it's a, it's a, if it's a business calculator, so in the process of just learning how to use the the calculator, it's got all these ratios programmed into it. So the, um, it's not unusual that the the book that comes with the the financial management calculator is on the same par as a textbook in in a business finance class. You know, when I took business finance, uh, I felt like I was in a physics course because some of these formulas get really, really big, and and it really is a challenge sometimes to, you know, your work your way through to you know to figure out the ratio and then look it up with, you know, on the, um, you know, the uh, Dun and Bradstreet, Dun and Bradstreet and Standard Poor's to find out, you know, is this ratio, you know, a, 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 um, average, above, below, and just how to interpret all this up. Anyway. Um, so again, here's current ratio, quick or acid test ratio, uh, inventory turnover ratio, average collection period ratio, uh, fixed asset turnover, uh, total asset turnover ratio, uh, total debt <coughs> to total asset uh, ratio, uh, uh, times uh, interest earned uh, ratio, uh, fixed charged coverage ratio, cash flow coverage ratio, uh, profit margin on sales ratio, basics earning power ratio, return on total assets ratio, return on common equity ratio, price to earning ratio, market to book um, a value ratio, and and so it can be a bit overwhelming. There's just know that um, when we when you if you go to a bank for a major bank loan, they are going to analyze your financial uh, statements to that kind of detail, and that's another reason why when you go into business, you want to keep the financial information going into your business totally separate from your your personal life because when bankers stumble into transactions that are personal and not business. Sometimes they, they'll, they'll, they'll separate it out, but sometimes they go, we're not interested. We want to deal with a real business, not a business that's got uh, your personal life blended into it. Um, I, I want to throw this out here, because when you start going, when we start looking at debt fu um, uh, equity funding, um, you know, we're, 
uh, there, depending on how successful your idea and concept is, there's a lot of people who are eager to loan you money, but they're going to have some pretty strict terms associated with it. So if they don't get out of the business uh, what they want to get out of the business in five years, their agreements say, well, now I own the business. If you don't pay me back what I am expecting in five years, then I own permanently uh, the business that I can tell you what to do. Uh, you work for me now. And so bear in mind, there, there can be some pretty nasty uh, uh, terms in case you uh, don't perform the way you might promise to perform when you receive the, the money from uh, your investor. Um, so the term angel investor sometimes is not so angel-y. Uh, sometimes an angel investor is really a vulture investor, vulture capitalist. Yeah, uh, like payday loans, you know, they're, they, they can have some pretty nasty terms. So you want to be really careful when you work with a professional startup business investor. Uh, there can be some pretty tricky stuff and, and so this is why, and, and when we get into types and funds um, you know, uh, uh, venture investors are what we call qualified investors because of the amount of money they have. But you're limited to, in most cases, in terms of private pr placement type money that you receive if you incorporate and you're selling equity interest, um, uh, that if you're not a qualified investor, meaning you, you, you're, you, your total value and your, and your annual income are below certain amounts, most uh, um, secretary of states or the, uh, uh, the, the state that you incorporate in limit the number of what we call unqualified investors to something like 20, 25, or 30. And the reason they do this is to, um, uh, to make sure uh, to uh, prevent uh, fraud type businesses from hurting a lot of people. And by definition, we're going to get, well, I'm getting ahead of myself just a little bit right now with the slides, but by d definition, a private placement uh, investor uh, is somebody that you, uh, we call friends and family, meaning you have, you have to show that you've known this person for over a year. You just can't walk up to somebody and say, you want to invest in my business. Um, uh, it's got to be someone that you've known for a year. So friends and family borrowing. Uh, is our next category and that's where um, so by definition you can only take money uh, from an equity standpoint from friends and family anyway and one of the things I encourage is to develop a friends and family advisory board where you give your business plan presentation um, you're asking for advice on your life in the business they, they feel they're a part of the business somehow they want they love you they want to see you you succeed and and doing some kind of deal where um, you ha uh, enter into a promissory note to pay them back by so at the end of every quarter or month you take a, a certain percent of your profits after you reinvest in the growth in the business and then you distribute the, that percent of the profits to the friends and family investors at a, uh, at a percent of representative of what they invested. So if um, one of your friends and family investors put up 25%, uh, let's say you need $100,000. And let's say uh, uh, one of the family, friends and family investors of four put in $25,000 to help get you off the ground. And so every time that you pay, uh, after the end of every quarter, what's not reinvested back in the, f in the firm from a profit standpoint, uh, in this case, 25% of what's left over would go to that investors that put the, the $25,000 in until it's paid off plus some kind of of, um, of interest such maybe you agree to pay um, one and a half times or one and a quarter times the money back or just a, a payback if 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 the if it's like you know your parents or something um, but know that friends and family borrowing 
is uh, uh, um, uh, an alternative uh, that uh, uh, that doesn't expose you to um, a vulture capital or a way to av avoid a, a bank loans, which you uh, and or, or running up your credit cards. Let's talk about stock and equity funding for a little bit here. You, you should be aware that there's two types of stock. There's common stock, which is stock that that what we call voting shares stock. If uh, that you have a, a vote a vote in what's going on with the organization, when you put the money in, there's what we call stockholder meetings, and you can you have a vote on decisions that the, that the, the stockholders are going to make. Uh, the um, and you're paid dividends uh, on the stock. So, to, uh, so when you buy stock, and we're going to talk about business valuation in, in a bit, because stock basically is you have a business valuation consultant who comes up with a big number, you know, evaluates the business, the business plan, and, and says, in five years from now, the business sh theoretically should be worth this much money, and uh, let's say $5 million. And um, and let's say then you, you form, uh, you, you're going to uh, have um, uh, 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 one million uh, shares of stock, and so if we take five million uh, and and and, uh, and divide that, uh, that's how we can start to figure out uh, divide the five million by one million. Then that's how we we can start to get a, a, an a, 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 um, an idea of what a share of stock is worth, and and for the purchase price for stock. Preferred stock works the same way, but preferred stock is non-voting stock, often, and preferred stock is stock that if the business defaults uh, and it goes into receivership or it has to dissolve, people who have preferred stock shares get paid off 100%. They are not exposing themselves to risk. They have a, uh, uh, a preferred position in the event that the company goes uh, fails and needs to be liquidated. They are going to be paid off first, and what's left over, the common stock shareholders get paid off. Um, also be aware that you can issue stocks, classes of stock, and, and know that there's different types of corporation, a C Corp and an S Corp, and, and we're, um, a colleague of mine uh, does a talk called Business Law 101. And uh, Alex Bruno. So if you if you search Google uh, uh, for Business Law 101, Alex Bruno, you can watch his like 40 minute presentation on Business Law 101 that goes into different types of corporations. Um, and but know that 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 for a C corp you can have different shares of stock. And so you can have, you can sell shares in stock relevant to phases of competitive development. So your first phase of funding, where the risk is highest, those investors will get the biggest bang for their investment. They'll get the most shares for their investment. Um, the uh, class B might be relevant to phase two, and the phase two investors are not going to get as much, many shares for their investment, and the phase, in this case, three stock purchasers would get even less shares because there's less risk. The business is growing. It's becoming more successful. So sometimes you can have classes of stock, class A, class B, class C, relevant to your phases of business development, and the value of those stocks can, can represent the amount of risk that the investors is taking at that particular time. That's another option you have. Um, so uh, we should also know that uh, there's what we call public versus privately held stock. And public uh, traded stock is stock that is purchased through the stock exchange, such as the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. And this, is, this kind of stock, you can, you can go up to someone and, and, and advertise in 
the Chicago Times or the LA Times stock for sale. You can make a pu public offering. But, but, um, but it's very, very, very expensive. And we're talking millions of dollars of legal fees, of accountant fees, and things like that to actually take a company public. It's a big deal. And 99.9999999999999% of startup companies are not in a position to make a public offering. Unless they got some, you know, patent for the cure for cancer or something like that. That's a totally different story. But most are, are looking for startup funding, small business type funding. And that's what we call a, a privately held stock. And, and we can't advertise this kind of stock for sale. It's got to be offered on a personal, uh, to friends and family only, people you've known for a year. And this is what we call privately held stock. Um, in terms of, of, um, of uh, uh, in terms of how to price stock, stock is um, priced by engaging uh, a business valuation consultant that's certified that has a track record and that knows how to take a look at your business even if it hasn't gone into business. He just has the business plan. Um, they are uh, certified professional people who can take the business, take a look at the company history, the industry analysis, market analysis, everything we've been talking about in our curriculum and the cash flow development that you developed, okay, that you worked with a bank and a CPA to develop and then submit the cash flow projections uh, for three to five years based on all the things you did in the industry analysis and market analysis and come up with a stock a value of the business five years from now or three years from now. And then they can take that value based on what the uh, business valuation consultant comes up and says, this is what the company's worth. Then you have to decide how many shares of stock you're going to request the state of, that you're in or state of California or New Mexico or Arizona or or Delaware is a popular place for uh, incorporating. And you request when you incorporate that, um, that uh, how many shares you want issued. And so by dividing the shares into the value, you can get a, a feel for what uh, this would say what the shares are worth. Now, $25, $10, $5, $100. You know, it's kind of an arbitrary thing in terms of the number of shares you, you choose um, to have issued. Um, and um, and so, uh, this, so this whole process starts with engaging a business valuation consultant. And up here I have the uh, American uh, Business Appraisers National Network. Um, but if you just Google uh, business valuation consultant, all the major um, CPA type uh, organizations will often have on staff uh, professional business valuation consultants. Uh, also, you can work with business brokers. Business brokers are often also certified at um, business valuation. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, private investor law and regulations. I, I really want to encourage you not to incorporate until you absolutely know your business is going to fly. Because, um, as I've mentioned earlier in these talks, it, it, you know, with less than $15 and a half a day of your effort, uh, you can become a corporation. And, uh, and, and, if you, and, then, and, and then once you become a corporation, you can open a checking account, you get an employer identification number, um, you get a resale number, you get a, a whole lot of um, accounts can be set up with state and federal uh, organizations on IRS tax identification. And, and so if you just said, oh my gosh, this, this business is not what I thought it was going to be. I'm not happy. I'm overworked. This is not an alignment of my life. I, I've made a big mistake. Um, well, by the way, if you don't, you, you have a certain amount of time to turn a, a business, a corporation off, or then you're going to be liable for what's called franchise tax fees. And most states want about $900, $800 to $900 a year uh, for just being a corporation. You don't even have to make any money. That You, you have to pay eight or $900 a year just to be a corporation in the state that you incorporated in. That's a big chunk of change, if you're, especially if you didn't really bring the business to market. And if you want to turn the business off, uh, you have to turn off and kill 
um, your, ta your, your, your federal tax identification number, your state tax identification number, um, as well as you have to turn this off with the Secretary of State. So you've got these three different, and sometimes four, entities that you have to say, I don't exist anymore. I'm shutting things down. And then they all have forms you've got to fill out uh, to, to end the life of the organization. And when you get these forms, you're going to realize you don't really understand what they say. You need to be a CPA or a business law attorney to know how to fill these forms out. And so next thing you know, you have to drive and go talk to an accountant. They're going to want probably a couple, two, three or five hundred dollars to fill these forms out. And if you go to an attorney, again, they're going to probably want two, three or five hundred dollars to fill these forms out. And you're going to have, a, you know, a day or two or more of your life explaining what didn't work and taking all this documentation to these consultants to assist you in shutting the business down. And if you ignore this and don't try to do it and just say, well, I'll let it die, well, next thing you know, you got the IRS after you. You've got the state, uh, the state you incorporated, the Secretary of State after you. You're getting these nasty letters in the mail that you're going to get sued and your, your credit. It can be a real mess. So think carefully before you incorporate. Um, and uh, so also you want to be, uh, one of the reasons why there's a lot of these laws and all these procedures in place, um, it's, it's to protect the society from investment fraud. Um, there's a lot of people form write business plans, form businesses, and their, their objective really is not to go into business. Their, their objective is to use this get-rich-quick concept and, and then approach you know, retired people or people who just aren't very, you know, um, intelligence about, you know, you know, wise versus stupid investments and, and see if they'll, you know, give them $10,000 for, a, you know, a fancy piece of stock that's got a picture of an eagle on and things like that. And he's got the money and he's gone and they've got this, this piece of paper that's got a picture of an eagle on it and it has their name and $10,000 on it and, and it's worth nothing. So, um, that's one of the reasons why uh, there's um, um, there's laws here. And so let's, let's talk about some of these investment law basics, just so you're aware of it. Um, you can only receive money from friends and family. Uh, uh, when people loan, buy stock from you, there's what's called an investor qualification form. It's got to be filled out and it's got to be signed. It's law. Uh, and, and if an investor uh, is under certain levels, there's what they are what's called an unqualified investor, which is, you know, it's limited to, um, you know, it limits the number of, of non-qualified investors. So if they're if it's your, you know, you're you're a family member uh, uh, that's going to reach into their own savings, they're probably not what we call a qualified investor, and you're limited to the number of un unqualified uh, investors that you you can um, have. Um, is there also <clears throat> limits on uh, the amount that can be funded. So let's, uh, depending on the, the regulations, an attorney sets this stuff up for you, by the way. So in order to make an offering, um, you have to approach uh, uh, an attorney, a business law attorney, that's going to develop for you a funding package that's going to have a subscription agreement, a stock purchase agreement. So here's a shocker, okay? If you want to uh, form a legal entity above and beyond just going down and getting incorporated uh, th that you can sell equity in, um, you're going to need what's called a subscription agreement prepared for you, which is, can be like 15, 17 pages long because it basically takes all the aspects of the business plan and, and it's just legal language that, um, that protects you. That's the whole harmless kind of stuff and, and it's basically deals with disclosures. And then there's a stock purchase agreement. Again, needs to be developed by a business law attorney. The average fee that attorneys charge to develop these documents is somewhere between, at minimum, $10,000 and maybe somewhere around the realm of fifteen or $16,000. No kidding. So you've got to spend a lot of money just to position yourself 
to sell equity interest in your, your, your business. So you, you kind of really think, this is why I get back and, 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 and emphasize the ingenuity aspect here and forming an advisory board and do the funding with friends and family and have some kind of uh, promissory note payback that has nothing to do with equity. You're paying back plus uh, an interest or a percent of the money you're borrowed that they're guaranteed to get. So if you say, well, I'm going to pay you back uh, 150%. So if you loan me 10000 then over time, and it, that could be years and years down the road, <clears throat> You're going to get fifteen thousand back, and it might be ten or twenty years from now, but you will get that back um, because every time we fund and you're on the advisory board, we're we're dividing. Uh, you're getting if we if, uh, you're getting a percent of what we're going to pay back to the friends and family, and, and we're not going to use the word investors, uh, 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 funders. Um, also, another thing to be aware of too, when you incorporate, you have to file um, uh, reports. Uh, you have to file uh, shareholder reports. You have to file stockholder reports. Uh, uh, you have to have meeting minutes. There's, there's re reporting requirements that you have to submit to the state you incorporate on on an annual basis. And so these things can um, and if you don't, if you miss the deadline, there's penalties and, and, and that you have to pay. So think before you leap. It's a lot of work to form a corporation, and once you start one, it can be a lot of work to turn it off. It's easy to jump in, but very hard to get out. Um, and, and as I was talking about before, this is just some, some imagery that just wanna, wants to bring, a, you know, make reality out of the attorney fees, the reporting fees, the IRS, the Secretary of State, um, franchise tax payments. Uh, it's, um, you, you, you be, really be aware of what you're getting into before you create this, this legal entity. Um, incorporating um, uh, again, I you know this person here that's you know that's buckled over, you know the table looking at all these reforms, and it can be a real night where it's, it's literally the amount of money that it, it, it uh, that it takes to turn a corporation can can run uh, uh, turn it off can run into the thousands, and just having it at minimum from the standpoint of hiring a competent a competent uh, tax accountant uh, and your franchise fee. At minimum, it's going to be something like a uh, two thousand dollars. I want to say something like fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars a year that you don't have to pay if you are a sole proprietorship. There's pros and cons, and this is where you have to, you know, have a um, relationship with a business law attorney uh, be because. One of the reasons people incorporate is for funding, but another primary reason why people incorporate is for um, to be shielded from uh, liability exposure. Well, bottom line is corporations as well as businesses have to have insurance policies, and so if you're you have good insurance policies in place, and you're not going to have a lot of business partners involved uh, that are part of uh, any form of ownership. Uh, or profit sharing, uh, it might be wise to consider a sole proprietorship versus a corporation uh, to avoid um, all that's associated with forming a corporation. Um, again, I encourage friends and family investment uh, uh, through some kind of family investment board, and you know you throw parties, and everybody's supportive in what you're doing. Um, uh, I also want to encourage a lot of ingenuity to be used in, in how you fund your business, and also be very aware uh, of um, the whole idea of making sure you're investing into cash flows. So before you start this big business, maybe invest in a little business um, that that you can afford very well to do yourself, get it to grow, maybe that uh, can be a full-time job um, at a very small, even maybe for forming a nonprofit, and maybe this, this ingenuity type startup business is how you meet people to build your advisory board that actually come up with a, the, a larger amount of friends and family uh, funding to get it off the ground. Well, that was a little bit of a long talk, um, but it's an important subject matter. Um, so that wraps up our talk on uh, business funding. S see you at our next lecture.